So my name is Kay Greveson and I'm the lead inflammatory bowel disease nurse here at the Royal Free Hospital. And I guess I'm here just to talk to you about my experiences of kind of looking after people with PSC or also have inflammatory bowel disease and share a few tips about colonoscopy, um, sedation and also to introduce you to a new website that I've developed for people with inflammatory bowel disease. Oops. So just as an overview, I'm, sh I'm not sure whether you kind of, somebody's discussed this with you already, but PSC is more common in people with ulcerative colitis than it is in Crohn's disease. And the majority of patients with PSC will develop ulcers will develop ulcerative colitis and a smaller proportion of people with ulcerative colitis will have PSC. So it's important from my point of view as a nurse to kind of look out for symptoms and signs and also to recognise things when patients tell me, you know, symptoms that they're experiencing. Symptoms of ulcerative colitis do usually appear early on. So with regards to kind of bowel cancer screening, there is an increased risk of bowel cancer in people with primary sclerosing cholangitis. As I'm sure many of you know, the recommendations are that you do a yearly colonoscopy so that we can assess, take biopsies and kind of make sure that we catch any lesions early on. And most of the information that we get about how to manage people with PSC and people who are at high risk comes from national guidance, which you can kind of see here. And this tells us things like how many biopsies we should take, how many times we, you know, what kind of things we should be doing during the test to be able to pick up small lesions and, and things like that. So looking more about the actual intricacies of having colonoscopy. As many of you are aware, bowel prep is a necessary evil that everyone needs to suffer. And it's something that is probably the worst part of the test, I think. That's what a lot of people say. And I found this on the internet, which I think kind of sums it up quite nicely. <laughs> and I think the person that actually invents bowel prep that tastes nice will never have to work again. <laughs> because I've, I personally have undergone a few colonoscopies, so I'm speaking from experience as well. And I know that it's, you know, it's not very pleasant. So looking at why it's important, I've put a picture up here so you can see the spectrum of what, a colon, a, you know, what the bowel looks like when you've got really good prep, compared to what it looks like on the right-hand side when it's really poor prep. And you can see from that that from the person who's doing the test, it'd be very difficult to see any lesions, to see any polyps, you know, to have a really good look at the bowel and to have a really good assessment. <coughs> so, and quite often, if you have anything that's on the spectrum of the poor prep, it might mean that you need to have a colonoscopy again, or you might need to consider other investigations. So as unpleasant as the prep is, it is important to take it so that we can get the excellent side of the spectrum rather than the poor side of the spectrum. There are other alternatives to colonoscopy, but colonoscopy is the only one where you can actually take biopsies. There's things such as a CT colonoscopy where you can look for kind of polyps and, th sorry, and things like that in the bowel. And there's also a thing called a capsule colonoscopy, which is a new kind of test where you swallow a little tablet and it takes pictures all the way down and into the bowel. Problem with this is you do still need the bowel prep and if it does show anything, you'd also need to have a colonoscopy. So the colonoscopy really is the gold standard. Again, looking at top tips for surviving prep, I'm sure many of you can probably tell me some top tips. But again, as I said, speaking from personal experience and just things that patients have told me, these are kind of the things that I think, you know, might kind of help. So morning appointment, it just helps because you're not fasting for as long. You can get the test out of the way and you, you get more chance to rest. There are different types of prep that you can have. And usually the prep is either, you know, it's, it's the hospital or the consultants that have decided what prep is going to be used at that hospital. And it's based on all the evidence of which one's the best which one gives the spectrum, which I showed you on the previous slide of the best prep. But if you do find that there's one that you like or you prefer, 
more than another one, you can request it. And as long as, you know, it, it's, it's fine to do that, and it's okay in your particular circumstance, then there should be no reason why not. Some of the preps have a higher volume than others. Things like Movi Prep, you have to drink about a litre of liquid. Whereas other ones such as Picolax and Fleet, it's a drink in the morning and a drink in the evening. But it's not suitable for everybody and sometimes those preps may be not going to give as good a result. Looking at actually taking the prep, I think it's good to kind of mix it with something. For some reason, they think that having a lemon and lime flavoured prep is the best. So you can mix it with something that kind of takes the taste away. So perhaps a strong cordial, like a black currant cordial, or, I mean, you could use a lime cordial, but something that's got quite a strong, distinct flavour that you can maybe mix with the prep just to make it a bit more palatable. The colder the better. It's fine to put the prep, once you've mixed it up in the freezer, for maybe half an hour. So it's not frozen, but it's a lot more chilled than it would be. And that just makes it go down a bit better and just makes it a bit more palatable. And also a chaser. By this I don't mean Zambuca. <laughs> but something that maybe you like. So as soon as you've had that glass and the drink of prep, you can follow it with something afterwards that will just take the taste away and it will just make it a bit more palatable for you. Now, it's our whole thing about having clear liquids, and it's okay for us to say just have clear liquids, but to have 24 hours of nothing but water and jelly and things like that isn't, you know, isn't the best. You can have things like boiled sweets. You can have caffeine, which will just help give you that extra energy when you're feeling a bit kind of low towards the end of the 24 hours, as long as you have no milk. So black coffee, black tea. You can have soups, but strain all the bits out. So you can have, you know, you can have like regular soups that you'd buy in the shop, but just make sure you strain it. So you're still retaining the flavour and it's still got some sort of palatability to it, but it's a bit better than having, you know, just water or just Lucasaid. Ginger ale or ginger beer, that can sometimes help and it can also help with any nausea feelings that you might be suffering from. Um, and just things like that can help. You can have carbonated drinks, Diet Coke, kind of anything like that, jelly and things that will just help keep your energy levels up. Does anybody else have any other tips that I've not included? Because I'm sure there's a lot more experience. Use a straw to drink. Yes, I was thinking that, yeah. A wide one as well, like a really big straw, yeah, because then you don't smell it and you can just, yeah, or hold your breath and then drink it really fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely some of the tips. So looking again at sedation. Sedation is obviously an option. You don't always have to have sedation, but many people want to have sedation to make the test more comfortable. And I think different people react differently to the sedation. There is definitely a recognised safe limit, and that's what most endoscopists kind of use, but not everybody tolerates that. Some people it works amazing, other people may find that it doesn't work so well for them and that they maybe feel a bit more of the, of the investigation than they wanted to. During the test, if you do find that it's uncomfortable, it's fine to say so and to maybe ask for more sedation. Um, there are other options to sedation, but these are usually reserved for people who really can't tolerate the test. So, you know, some people have got more sensitive guts and they do find the test more uncomfortable than others. It's not your fault, it's nothing that you're doing. It's just that maybe, you know, you've, you've got a more sensitive gut and, and you don't, you, you know, the test is a bit too much uncomfortable. So another option for people is something called propofol. It's not used on everybody and it's certainly not appropriate for everybody, but it is something where you can have a much stronger, it's almost like an anaesthetic where uh, anaesthetist has to be there. So again, you know, most people, the regular sedation, which is midazolam, that is what is usually used, that is the one that should kind of be used in different doses, but there are other options available. Touching on a bit what Linda said, working with kind of the IBD team and also the hepatology team, 
There is definitely inconsistencies in the amount of care and I think it depends where you're based, where your care is based for both IBD and hepatology because obviously unless you're based for both the IBD and the hepatology within the Royal Free, sometimes communication can be a bit sporadic between the teams and I think that's something that, that is really important that if you are at a hospital that's quite far away from your main hepatology kind of liver centre that there needs to be good communication between the two teams talk to each other so that we know what's going on with both conditions and obviously a bit of a typo there but share details with us it's important particularly from a gastroenterology point of view you know we're not specialists in liver so we need you to kind of share information with us share any symptoms that you might be getting even you might not realize that the symptoms you're experiencing might be due to your PSC so it, but it's important to kind of let us know so that we can act on it and also then liaise with the liver teams and the liver nurses to be able to support you better so this is moving on just to talk about um, a website that I have developed this website actually is for people with inflammatory bowel disease but it is particularly important as well for people who are on immunosuppression so people that may be on immunosuppression after you've had a liver transplant because after, if you're on immunosuppression it can affect you when you travel you may be more susceptible to illnesses when you travel abroad and you might have um, more susceptibility to kind of vaccinations and this particular interest in kind of what vaccinations you can have when you're taking medication that suppresses your immune system. So I conducted um, research looking at this in people with inflammatory bowel disease and found that the knowledge was pretty limited, that people didn't really prepare for travel that much, that they weren't aware of what live vaccines they could, well, what vaccinations they could have, and that a lot of people actually weren't even aware that they could, couldn't have a live vaccine when they're on immunosuppression. And a lot of the literature that has been done, very limited studies actually, only three studies that have been done. And one of the studies showed that 27% of people on immunosuppression were incorrectly told to have a live vaccine. So it kind of made me think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done about raising awareness and improving education for, for these people. So I developed a website which is called IBD Passport. It's been live since November last year. It was entirely kind of nurse-led and all the research that led up to it was nurse-led. I collaborated with a web design agency and also the patient charity group which is Crohn's and Colitis UK. And I worked with them to develop what is and what I hope is an evidence-based resource. So what I've developed here isn't really, well, I suppose it is something new in the concept of the website, but the information that's contained within the website is what is available out there already. It's just things that maybe people aren't aware of. So I've sourced information from government websites, um, travel websites, all the patient charity support groups, and I've put it all together into one resource so that everything you would need for planning a trip, for looking at whether it's safe to travel when you're on a particular medication is all on this website. So just to briefly show you, um, the top is an interactive world map where you can search by country and you can look at country specific travel advice and it'll also tell you what vaccinations are needed in that particular country. The bottom panel is where the majority of the information is. So it's got loads and loads of information about, as I said, vaccinations, traveling after surgery, what kind of key things you need to know, traveling, um, you know, how to manage traveler's diarrhea when you're abroad, and also how to obtain healthcare when you're abroad, because that is one of the key things that if you're traveling overseas, you want to be reassured that if you need to get medical advice, you can. It's also got um, a travel checklist for patients to download that makes, you know, that's kind of got the key information that you need. And it's got an app that you can download where you can scan and carry all your medical records with you wherever you go. So it's a secure portable device. Um, you can scan your results, your tests, your clinic letters. And then when you're in your destination, you can print them off. 
And finally, it's got a section for healthcare professionals that's it's got a list of all the basic resources for travel and IBD, and it's got all, a link to all the main um, kind of UK guidelines and European guidelines. So just to show you, as I said, it's been live since November 2014. So far, there's over 10,000 users and just under 1,000 registered patients on the website. And I have had extremely good feedback. I did a user evaluation survey earlier this year and a lot of the people said that actually it's made it so they're more aware of the vaccinations that they need to have. It's made them more aware of the importance of getting insurance. And that is, you know, no matter what chronic condition you've got, it's important to get insurance that covers that so that if you travel abroad, you're covered and you're not going to have any big medical expenses. And people feel that they've got more knowledge and awareness and understanding of travel issues and chronic disease. So I'm looking at improving the content. I'm wanting, it's intended to be a global resource. In order to do that, it needs to be translated into different languages. So that is the next step. And I'm just looking at improving it continually. And I think this website could be extrapolated to other diseases as well, not just inflammatory bowel disease. And because obviously a lot of people are immunosuppressed or taking immunosuppressant medications, it can also be relevant to them. Thank you. <laughs>